Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are being joined today by one of the most famous investors on the planet. He's very humble. He's coming to us from Singapore. He is Mr. Jim Rogers. Jim is an author, a financial commentator, whose work is regularly featured in the top media outlets throughout the world. Jim has an incredible life story, which includes co-founding the Quantum Fund, which returns a 4,200 percent profit in 10 years. It allowed him to retire at the age of 37. Since then, he has traveled the globe. He's written fantastic books, and he maintains actually one of the most prestigious reputations in the world when it comes to investing. In honor of Jim's appearance on this show today, we've actually compiled some of his most important notes, accomplishments, and books in one free epic report for everyone at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Jim. And now it is my privilege to introduce Mr. Jim Rogers. Jim, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am delighted to be here, Michelle. It's morning here, so I will say good morning. But Michelle, listen, I want you to know I make a lot of mistakes. You know, it's not it's not so easy. You, you want to hear about my first wife? Oh, my God, what a mistake that was. <laughs> you know, I make plenty yes, of mistakes. Yes, we like to hear that, actually. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Oh, you're right. You might as well ask me where I went to college. It's, it's a long, long time ago. Fortunately, it's a long, long time ago. Well, we have followed your career and actually studied your career, and it is probably one of the most impressive that we have on file in our library, and we're honored to have you on this show today. Now, Jim, we want to start off with China. We know that you are much more familiar with China than most Americans are. The word communism is what many people think of when they think of China's politics, also of its traditions and its economy. Is that a correct depiction? Is that a term that would apply or would you choose some other description for China? Well, first of all, using the word tradition, they've only been, they've been quote communist since 1949. So that's only 60 years, 70 years or so. They have centuries of entrepreneurship and capitalism, and they've been extraordinarily good at it at times. Yes, Mao Zedong came along and changed that for a while, and they still call themselves communist, uh, Michelle, but they're among the best capitalists in the world, if not the best capitalist in the world right now. That is very interesting that you say that, because I've talked to actually two guests in the past month that said that exact same thing, that there's some of the best capitalists in the world. And that's not something that typically Americans think of. Could you expound on that in relation to China? In 1978, a guy named Deng Xiaoping, who was the leader, said, we've got to try something new. Mao Zedong had put him in jail. He First of all, he'd been Mao Zedong's great ally. Then Mao I'll put him in jail because he was saying strange things like we better try something new. And he started opening up China. He said, quote, um, you know, I don't care if it's a black cat or a white cat as long as it catches mice. We need to catch some mice in this country. And he started opening up and they have been the most astonishing country in the world in the last 40 years. They've opened up. You know, everybody knows now that the GDP is the second largest in the world, second only to the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when I first went to China in 1984, it was still a backwater. Now, I mean, they've got the best infrastructure, the best airports, best, best of many things, and it continues to grow. Now, Michelle, having said that, there will certainly be problems in China. I don't think I'm sitting here saying that this is some kind of a nirvana. You know, in America, we became the most successful country in the 20th century. But along the way, we had 15 depressions. We had a horrible civil war. We had massacres in the streets. We had very little rule of law. So China will have many problems along the way, just as we did. But I'm teaching my children Chinese. In today's structure, it's very interesting that you just mentioned that, that you're teaching your children Chinese. Coming from your background as an investor, what do you think the best intellectual skills are right now to teach children in today's world? Curiosity. Uh, I'm trying to teach my children to be curious and to think independently, which is very difficult. Most people just go on the Internet or the TV and they say, oh, the sky is blue. They don't even go over and look out the window to see if the sky is blue, because if the TV says it's blue, it must be blue. So I'm trying to teach them to think independently, 
uh, to think for themselves, which is very hard in, in our day. Uh, and I'm teaching them to be curious, to try to explore everything. And, of course, I'm trying to teach them to beware of boys. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, yeah, it's really hard these days to think for yourself. There's so much pressure to think the way that everybody else thinks or else you're going to be punished. I don't know. You're in Singapore right now. I don't know if you've heard about the most recent event in Hollywood. We have several very prominent actors and actresses, one of them, Deborah Messing, who has called for a list of people that vote in a certain way so that everyone will refuse to work with them. That was the bottom line of the point. And it's so absurd, Jim, in, you know, what's supposed to be a free country with free thought and free votes and free speech. And the most important thing about our country being a free country is to stand up for other people's right to have opposing opinions. I might not agree with you, but my most important premise is that you have a right to say whatever you want to say because it's America. Speak on that to us. Well, I certainly agree with, with that point of view. That's what America used to be all about. It's becoming less and less like that. Uh, many people in America think you should not be allowed to say what you want. Uh, there are even people who say, I live in Singapore. There are people who say, I cannot live in Singapore. I'm an American. I have to live in America. I said, when did that happen? That's what North Korea says. That's what Cuba says. But there are many Americans who are starting to say things like that. You cannot say that, whatever that is. You cannot live there, even if you want to. If you're an American citizen, you cannot invest there because we say you cannot. So, no, it's, it's America's closing off. I certainly don't like to see it. As you've said, I've driven around the world a couple of times. I'm very keen on the world. I've been investing around the world for 50 or 60 years. So I'm very, very keen to be a citizen of the world, as a great Frenchman once said, Voltaire. So, uh, yeah, it, it's not good for America. Many countries are doing it. China's starting to do it some as well, you know, and, and great ideas come because people get exposed to strange nuts who say the strangest things, you know, we, but we had, uh, what was his name? Patrick Henry in 1775 saying strange things like give me Liberty, you know, and there were people in, in America in the 1770s saying the wildest things like we want to vote, you know, but because of those strange things, and those were very strange things in those days, uh, America changed. People said strange things about the Internet, you know, but because of that, fortunately, we have the Internet. In fact, you and I could not be talking now if we didn't have the Internet because some strange teenagers went into the garage and started saying strange things and doing strange things. And here we are, not just in America, all over the world. Yeah, opposing opinions. It's what creates creation. If everyone's the same, you have a robotic situation that creation is basically eliminated from. Well, and they are now trying, there are people trying to, to control the internet as well. I mean, in China, America, many places they are. As far as I'm concerned, <coughs> let a thousand blossom to bloom because some of them will be nuts. But that's how we make progress, dealing with strange ideas. Right. Right. I want to let everyone know that um, when I first started off this interview with Jim, I introduced him as one of the most prestigious investors that the world has ever seen. And he stopped me. And that's why I said, you know, he's very humble. And we actually started over. But you really are. Your um, life's work has been so incredible. Talk to us about the co-founding of the quantum fund because i think that's one of the most spectacular things in the history of investing well back in uh, the late 60s early 70s uh, i was looking for a job uh, hedge funds were very there were very few at the time you could count them on on one hand uh, and another guy was looking for a young man to work for him and we hit it off and we started a hedge fund. Uh, we were actually working at a hedge fund, in fact, for another a big company, a bigger company. But then Washington changed some regulations, which says you cannot do hedge funds within the structure of another company. So we had to go off on our own. 
thank goodness for bureaucrats making mistakes with unintended consequences. So off we went. There were two of us and a, and a secretary in a little office. And, well, we had to make money or go out of business. And so we both loved what we were doing. And uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I didn't want to do anything else. It was so much fun. So off we went and we had a, a few successes. A few successes. Yes, you did, <laughs> sir. Um, to put this into context, your partner was George Soros, correct? Yes. And, yes, yes, yes. Um, for, for over that 10 year period, you struck probably the biggest gains ever known as 4,200%. Were you inspired to do that? Or did, did you follow some sort of um, tactic? Talk to us about the thought process. Michelle, I just loved what I was doing and was scared to death. I knew if we didn't do it right, we'd go out of business. I mean, there were two of us in the room with all this money. And if we didn't get it right, the money would leave and we'd have to leave too. But I happened to love what I was doing. It was just, it consumed me. Uh, he was, he loved it too. And obviously he was good at it. So we had, a, as I say, we had a few successes, but that's, that was so much fun for me. I, I, I couldn't imagine doing anything. It wouldn't have had to pay me. Fortunately, I did. I, I couldn't work for free because I would, didn't have any money. But I would have done it for free if I could have afforded it. That's so extraordinary because they say the things that you do best are the things you would do for free. Really? Yeah, the things you love. Yes, when you fall. People who follow their passions usually are successful. And even if they're not successful, they don't care because they're happy. You know, yes. happy people don't care if they have 16 cars or not. Right. I think that's a key to life. If you're happy, who cares? That really is. <laughs> okay. Now, shifting gears back to the economy, sir. Since the year 2000, when the S&P 500 traded at 1,500, it has doubled, um, not including dividends. And this has been, though, one of the worst 19-year stretches in its history. And since it bottomed out in 2002 at 800 points, it has not even gone up by 400%. However, it's been rising consistently over the past 10 years. When you adjust for alternatives, the earnings yield is still much higher and better than bonds. So Jim, in your thought process, can this bull market last another decade, given the fact that the main buyer throughout all of this has been corporate buybacks? You mean the stock market bull market, the U.S. stock market? Yes. Uh, well, the United States stock market has now been up 11 years uh, without a, a bear market. That has never happened in American history. Michelle, there's no reason it can't be 111 years without a, without a bear market, but it never has. It never has before in history. And most countries around the world have the same kind of uh, statistics and, and history. So if we're ever going to have a bear market again, and I assure you we are, Michelle, we're getting closer and closer. Uh, it is, it's not going to be fun the next time we have a bear market. In 2008, we had a bear market because of too much debt. Michelle, since then, the debt has skyrocketed everywhere, everywhere. So the next bear market is going to be the worst in my lifetime. And I think I'm older than you, so it's gonna be the worst in your lifetime too. You should be worried. Yeah. It is. This is actually quite frightening because when you put together the whole landscape of what everybody's saying, we're really headed for not just a United States crash, an entire world crash, and possibly imminently. Well, Michelle, it's already started in many places. The U.S. stock market is near its all-time high, but many, I mean, Japan is down 50% from its all-time high. I mean, tw and that was 29 years ago. But more currently, you know, the very Germany's down. Most stock markets around the world are, have started into a bear market. It always starts where we're not looking. In 19, I'm sorry, in 2007, it started in Iceland when they went bankrupt, but nobody cared or even noticed. But then Ireland went bankrupt, and then, oh my gosh, Bear Stearns went bankrupt, and a few weeks later, months later, Northern Rock went bankrupt in the UK, and the next thing you knew, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Well, by then, it was on the evening news, and by then, everybody knew, Michelle. But it starts that way, and it works its way 
through small places nobody's looking at. It's already happened. Latvia's gone bankrupt. Indian banks are having trouble. Argentina's having serious problems. I can go on and on. It's already started, and very few stock markets have been strong recently. And because everybody's so interconnected, when one starts to fall, it's going to affect everybody else. Well, you're talking about 2019. You're exactly right. But even before, you know, in the 19th century, there'd be bear markets in London that would affect New York. So it's, it's always been that. It takes longer, and it's been less connected in the past, but it's, we're getting more and more connected. You're right. Mm. If now, there's bear market, if, if suddenly tomorrow the German stock market collapses, we're all going to know within two minutes. You know, maybe a hundred years ago, it would have taken us two weeks to find out. Now we're all going to know immediately. Instantly. Now, sir, Steve Bannon compared the trade war taking place right now between President Trump and China with President Reagan and how he dealt in the days of the USSR. Bannon says that the notion that the United States is a declining empire is false and that there is no reason that the US would lose its status as a dominant world economy, but that it still must make changes. Of course, the Chinese do outnumber the United States in population by four to one. But Jim, is that enough of a reason to cite them as a bigger world power in the 21st century than the United States? Well, they do have the second largest economy in the world now. They are the largest population in the world. They have a very large geographic area. They're the same size as the continental uh, United States. So they certainly are changing and growing. China is the only country, Michelle, that I know of that's had recurring periods of greatness. Great Britain was great once, Rome was great once, Egypt was great once, but China spent the absolute top three or four times in history. They also collapsed, total collapse, three or four times in history, but they're the only ones who turn around and rise to the top after a few decades or a few centuries. In my view, it's happening again, whether we like it or not. And there will be setbacks along the way. Don't worry. Uh, Mr. Bannon says the U.S. is not, not in decline, I think was the way you put it. Uh, well, I don't know. History will judge. But I do know America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. No nation in world history has ever been this deep in debt. And the debts are rising every day, <laughs> every second, every hour. You know, things are getting worse. Uh, I hope we're not in decline. I'm an American citizen, taxpayer, voter, as are my children. So I hope we're not in decline, but the facts would indicate that countries in the past that have gotten into this dilemma have had crises or semi-crises. But I hope Mr. Bannon's right. I hope he's smarter than, than I am. Yes. Now you are an American and Jim, you, you grew up in a small town in America and you've built such an amazing life. And I wanna remind everyone that they can take the opportunity to download our free overview of Jim's work at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Jim. Now, Jim, I want to take a moment right now to shift to the central banks. The main question is, are these institutions fit to handle the roles that they've been given? Because we are now in enormous economic problems. What is the root of this problem? Because the whole planet is now drowning in debt. Are these problems coming from governments? Of course they are, Michelle. I, I don't know about you, but I doubt if you're anywhere near as in debt as the United States government oh. and our states. <laughs> and I, I mean, percentage-wise, percentage-wise, or our states or our uh, cities around the world. But it all comes from the, mainly from the U.S. Central Bank. I hate to say it, but, you know, 200 years ago or even 30 years ago, very few people in America could have named the head of the central bank or even would have known what it was. Now, of course, the head of the central bank becomes some kind of godlike figure. He must know everything. He's the head of the central bank. He's the head of the Federal Reserve. Michelle, these guys are just bureaucrats and academics who usually couldn't make it in the real world. And so they get government jobs. That's why they're working for the government. And they don't have a clue what they're doing. They, we all think they don't. I, many people, the TV and the Internet, think, oh, my gosh, he's head of the Federal Reserve. She's head of the Federal Reserve. She must know everything. They don't know anything. 
They've gotten us into deep problems now. The balance sheet of the central bank in America has gone up five or six times in the last 10 years. I mean, that, has, that sort of thing has never, ever happened in world history, anywhere in the world. Interest rates are the lowest they've been in world history, driven mainly by the American Central Bank. That's where it started. I mean, everybody, all the other central banks jumped in like they know what they're doing. The Japanese have said, we will print as much money as necessary. I mean, that's what he guy said. He's not making, I'm not making this up, and he's doing it. Every day, the Japanese central banks prints money and buys stocks or ETFs and buys bonds. I mean, this is madness. This has never happened uh, world, in world history. You know, America's had three central banks. The first two disappeared, fortunately. Well, this was going to disappear, too, because they keep making such gigantic mistakes and they keep running up such huge debts. They're getting the rest of us, the rest of the world, not just America, deep in debt. So, no, this is going to end very, 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 very badly. I mean, you should, you, you should watch Michelle Holiday and find out what's going on. If you watch, you'll get worried. You'll get knowledgeable first. Then you'll get worried. And maybe you will take actions to protect yourself because the American Central Bank is not going to save you. They're going to be out of business themselves. It's just incredible. You know, we just had Gerald Salente on this show, and he talked about the trillions that are being, but they're not even being printed. It's just digital money. Well, they, okay. they stack up trillions and trillions of digital money, and then it, they call it our debt. You know what I mean? And that's just so absurd. I hate to say it, Michelle, it is our debt, whether we like it or not. As long as we're, but it's not just Americans, because everybody, Everybody in the world is now running up gigantic. Well, North Korea is not. Nobody will lend to North Korea, but just about everybody else in the world is running up huge debts. It's just outrageous. I want to shift now to the topic of precious metals because you mentioned <clears throat> protecting ourselves. Gold has outperformed the S and P 500 since 1971. It's been a wealth creator, and now it's still outperforming stocks again this year. Do you believe that we are headed toward a $2,000 per ounce gold? Well, Michelle, I've actually owned gold since 1971. It was illegal in 1971 for Americans to own it, but I did. So you're using not a very good statistics. If you use the right statistics, they can tell you anything they want. But remember, gold had been, uh, the price had been rigged by, American, by the American government for nearly 40 years uh, up to 1971. So when you say it's outperformed, yes, it has, but it came from a rigged base that was absurd. Uh, yeah, of course, it's done very well. And if you pick the right periods, gold has done better than anything, anything you want to pick. And silver, too. I own gold. I own silver. I own lots of gold and silver. I uh, haven't bought any significant until recently. Uh, I don't plan to sell my gold and silver throughout history. When you've had people lose confidence in governments or in money, they turn to gold and silver. doesn't matter whether they should or not, Michelle. They always have, and they always will. So I'm just a French peasant. You know, I own gold. I've got it hidden away, and I will be buying more as the situation deteriorates. Yes. So that's one of your biggest um, probably safety nets that you could suggest? Well, I own a lot of gold and silver. Well, you can ask me in 10 years whether it was a good safety net or not, but that's <laughs> what I own now. I own other things too, but, but I certainly own gold and silver. My children own gold and silver. Now, Jim, in the coming months, it appears that financial entitlements in the Western world will force our governments to meet obligations, facing the risk of inflation due to excessive currency printing and devaluations, or to cut the entitlement programs such as Social Security. But 90% of our elder population will not survive without Social Security. So Jim, what is the best way to overcome these challenges? And what do you feel is the best way to prepare in case they do go south? Well, everybody, Michelle, has to do what they know best. Uh, I will constantly tell people, you should not listen to people on the internet. Well, maybe Michelle, but don't go on the internet and think you're gonna find safety and wisdom. Everybody should only invest in what they themselves know about. 
if I tell you to, to buy silver and you have no idea what silver is or where to buy it or how to buy it, don't buy silver because some guy said it on the internet. If you become knowledgeable and if you know what you're doing, then maybe you would do what many people have throughout history. You would learn about gold and silver. You would learn about ways to protect yourself. But the only way you're going to come through the next problem is to know what you're doing, to know why you did it and what the consequences are. If you listen to somebody else and things go wrong, you don't know what to do. You don't know why you're there in the first place. So please don't listen to me. Don't listen, well, maybe Michelle, but don't listen to most people until you yourself know what you're doing. Yeah, I own a lot of gold and silver and will continue to buy gold and silver, but you may find something better than gold and silver. What's if you do, on? if you do, by the way, send me an email. <laughs> I want to know what it is. Share it with everybody, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> For everybody. Now, I'll um, do my homework. <laughs> what are your thoughts on cryptos? Well, they're all going to disappear. Uh, money is going on the internet. There's no question that all of our money will be internet. It's already, I was trying to buy an ice cream in, in China the other day. <laughs> the poor woman couldn't sell me an ice cream. I had money. I had Chinese money. She couldn't take money. Because she could only take uh, internet money. So she gave me the ice cream in the end. She felt sorry for this, this old fool who, who only had money. So money is going to be on the internet. It already, you can't take a taxi in China with money. You know, everything has to be on, the, on your phone. And I, I have it now. Uh, so money is definitely going to be on the internet. Countries, country, companies are trying to figure out a way. Is it going to be cryptocurrency? No, they're all going to disappear and go to zero. Really? Now let's stay with this topic. Now, Was are I you? Unclear? <laughs> no, 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 no. You have my interest way, way up, peaked. Um, so you're predicting Bitcoin and everything else that falls under that category is simply going to disappear. Expound on that for us, sir. I must have been unclear. No, no, uh, many, unclear. many, al you just need to know. many, al many already have. You know that hundreds of these things have already disappeared. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And the, and the crypto guys say we're smarter than the government. And they are. There is no question they're smarter than the government. But the government has the guns, Michelle. And, well, in the 1930s, before that, people used to use anything they wanted for money, seashells, gold coins, uh, p banks could print their own money if, as long as people would accept it. So they used anything. The Bank of England, which was the most important central bank in the world at the time, said, OK, guys, from now on, it is an act of treason, an act of treason if you use anything for money except our money. Guess what? An act of treason means they execute you. So people stopped using seashells, sugar cubes, gold coins, and everything else. And so that's what's going to happen again. Yes, the money will be on the Internet, but it's going to be their money. Now, as I say, the crypto guys are smarter and maybe some of them will continue. But most of us don't want to be executed for an act of treason. So we're going to use government money. I'm not happy about this, Michelle. I wish we could somehow get rid of government control of money. But there's been no time, a few times in world history when government money did not come to prevail. Maybe short periods, other things, but no. So you believe that ultimately the Bitcoin and everybody that owns it will simply be locked out of actually utilizing it. It's going to disappear. It's going to go to zero. When the government says you can't use it, who's going to use it? Maybe you, maybe Sam, maybe Mary, maybe Bob, but the rest of us are going to use government money on the computer. Now it may be, I mean, maybe somebody like JP Morgan, just about a bank X, will come up with a way to use money on the computer, but it's going to be officially recognized, accepted money, or it's, you're going to go to jail. And by the way, Michelle, this, this does not even get into the possibility that the, the internet system goes down, electricity goes down. You know, there have been many times in history when you have a crisis, turn on the light switch, Nothing happens, you know. There have been periods, prolonged periods in some countries, in some cases, when the whole infrastructure just doesn't work. So if you have all of your money in electronic money and it doesn't work anymore, I would suggest you have a few silver coins in your back pocket so that when you go to the grocery store, 
the guy will sell you some bread. That is such an interesting perspective because so many people believe that cryptocurrency is the future. The independent, decentralized cryptocurrency is the future, I should say. Oh, right. I make many mistakes. I told you about my first wife. You know, you want to hear about other mistakes? Maybe I'm wrong again. But I, and, and they are smarter than the government. But I repeat, the government has the guns, just as they did in the 1930s when people used anything. They, everything was decentralized. Everything was totally decentralized. If you were a Scottish peasant, you used what you wanted for money. Uh, and everybody in the world did. But then along came that bank with the guns and changed it. So, I mean, by all means, if you want to do it, Michelle, do it. Don't listen to me. Make your own decisions. But my decision is that I know that when the system collapses, if it does, those gold coins over there in my closet are going to be useful. And those silver coins are going to be useful. Absolutely. I want to touch back real quick before we go on something you spoke of, because as an American, um, you're living in Singapore and, um, and myself being American who's never been to Singapore, you spoke of the fact that they don't take cash at all for anything. Everything's done on the internet. That was in China. It was not in Singapore. Oh, okay. Singapore, Singapore is moving that way. Singapore is moving that way, but China is far, far ahead of most of the world in electronic money. Okay. It was China. Now, um, this brings to mind for me that a good portion of our population, indeed throughout the world, are unbanked. They use cash, they use coins, they have no internet access, they are cash citizens, you know, the poorer people. What happens to that portion of the population in that circumstance? Well, they're not going to have Bitcoin if they don't have a computer. You know, how they, they, it's not going to work. Uh, that's why I would suggest that most of those people save some silver coins or silver something uh, or gold. And, and when they need it, they have it. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the world. I do know we're going to have more crises. The world has always had economic crises and political crises throughout history and will again. And I would suggest to most of those people that they have some alternative to the internet and to electronics. We will see. As you say, your guys who are smarter than I am and smarter than government say, don't worry, Bitcoin or one of something like it is going to save us all. I hope so, but I doubt it. It's going to be, it's all going to be on the computer as long as the internet exists, as long as electricity exists. But, it's going to be their money. They want this, Michelle. Then they know everything you do. It's a lot better than money for them. You know, they will know if you, they'll call you up and say, Michelle, you've had too much coffee this month. What are you doing? Why are you drinking so much? They'll know everything you do. But if you have money in your pocket, they don't know what you're doing. No, they, the government's love, love, love. It gives them more control. I don't like it, but who cares about me? I'm just telling you, it's coming whether we like it or not. And I don't like it. It's such an interesting perspective. Um, it's certainly not my point of view that uh, cryptocurrency is going to take over. I don't like it because I think that exactly it takes away the freedom of having money in your pocket. And it takes away the privacy of what you do when you purchase something and what you purchase. Um, so I do have my own perspectives on these and it's very different from what friends of mine have. However, um, what you're speaking of is the actual purposeful um, cashless society that what everyone's talking about. So that's what essentially what you see coming is a no cash, but the digital currency that's used is controlled by the government. It's already happening in China, the largest country in the world, the second largest economy in the world. They already have basically a cashless society, but the Internet money they use is government money. When I bought, tried to buy the ice cream from the lady, if I gave her my phone, it would have been government money that I was paying with on her phone and my phone. Uh, now I have it on my phone, but what I use on my phone when I'm in China is Chinese money. I don't go, as you know, I can't go over there and buy a Mercedes with Bitcoins. I can't buy ice cream with Bitcoins. In fact, there are very, very, very few places in the world you can use any of this. 
to actual use commerce or a buy and sell. Okay. So is that the yuan that's on it's, the digital it's, currency? It's, it's renminbi, which is also known as the yuan, yes. Like you in the U.S., we have U.S. dollars or bucks. You know, we can have bucks in our pocket or we can have dollars in our pocket. In China, you can have renminbi in your pocket or yuan in your pocket. Okay, but it's not in your pocket in China. It's uh, on your no, phone. For the, it's in my pocket. I, have, I still have the stuff, but most people don't have money. As I say, you can't take a taxi. You know, the taxi driver says, where's your phone? So, no, you have to, you have, to have electronic money for the most part in China already. I just find that a fascinating topic, and I'm sure many of our viewers will too, because we don't realize how far digital has gone. And actually, I mean, it, a cashless society scares me. Well, it's already happening uh, in China. Other Asian countries are catching up. America's behind uh, as far as this sort of thing is concerned. But it's, it's going to happen, whether we like it or not. Uh, it is happening, whether we like it or not. And as I say, maybe it's going to be government money. It already it is government money in, in China. I don't think the Chinese are suddenly going to say, okay, guys, now you use Bitcoin if you want to instead of our money any more than the English in 1934, whatever year it was, said that. They said, you got to use my money or you're going to prison or going to be executed. So the bottom line is the USD, the yuan, whatever it is you're using, it stays that currency. However, it becomes entirely digital. It will be digital, yes. But I would urge you to have something else in your pocket or in your closet in case everybody should have a plan B. And throughout history, gold and silver have been the plan B, whether we like it or not. You know, poor peasants like me for thousands of years have turned to gold and silver in emergencies or when we had to. And we will again. I'm going to go out of my closet pull out some silver coins and go buy a beer. If you come to Singapore, I'll buy you a beer. Well, I'll buy you tea. I'll buy you a cup of tea uh, okay. if you come to Singapore. But I have the money in the closet. Don't worry. Wow. Jim, this has been an amazing interview. Please mention also where to find your books. Yeah, well, my books, you can go to my website, which is jimrogers.com. But you can also go to Amazon. They, they'll sell you my books better than, than I can. Uh, you know, I have some books, yes, but I don't have anything to sell. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. It's been my delight. When you come to Singapore, I'll have enough money in the closet to buy you tea. Okay. okay. That's a plan. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Mr. Jim Rogers, international investor, author, and commentator, whose exceptional work is profiled in our exclusive report at portfoliowealthglobal.com slash Jim. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at portfoliowealthglobal.com.